Okay, Woody, thank you so much for coming. Thank um, you. I, thank you for having me. I, I, I reached out to you first because I um, am a big fan of the YouTube channel Characters Welcome, as I often say that I think it's a really... Actually, Valerie is a uh, someone I know, and she does stand-up comedy, and I've often been telling her that this is a revolutionary new way to be on the stage and entertain and to do like a one-man... To, to just kind of do a one-man show. And I wanted to ask, I, I wanted to ask how you sort of came, came along with this, um, how this sort of happened. I guess the, the one-man um, one monologues that you do in terms of, um, in terms of the, uh, the character's welcome page. Sure. And then I'm gonna play a clip for everyone so they can see what it is. Ooh. Okay, do you want me to wait for the clip or do you want me to answer? Oh, I was hoping you'd first. explain it and then maybe we sure, go through yeah. your life a little bit like a, in a James Lipton way, but you know. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so if people don't know, uh, Characters is a, uh, it's, it's, it's a category of performance that the UCB kind of codified uh, in their uh, system. So uh, UCB, the Upright Citizen Brigade Theater teaches uh, improv and sketch in New York City and Los Angeles. Um, and, uh, part of it came from, uh, it was always seen, UCB was always seen as a pipeline for providing talent eventually for SNL potentially. So they were like, we don't have any kind of like system that trains performers to write comedic characters for themselves. Cause that's when they're traditionally, when they're casting for SNL, they look at standups and they look up, uh, character comedians. Traditionally, they look at uh, standups for writing and uh, characters for the actors although of course that gets muddled all over the place depending on who you are and, and when you're whatever year you're auditioning um so what they did was um ucb started this characters program uh, it was michael hartney along with uh some of his friends i don't remember exactly who it was i believe don finelli was there i believe uh, john bander and justin tyler um a lot of great very talented funny people um and the idea was to create um an environment where you could, similar to sketch, uh, work in a room with other people pitching jokes, essentially, that would allow you to write comedic monologues that uh, that served your strengths, that showcased you, that were like, this is what you would get if you were to hire me for SNL or for a sketch show. Um, these are the kinds of characters I play, and these are the kind of jokes that are like kind of pre, that I've already had ready to go. Um, it's to it's essentially to demonstrate value. Um, and it didn't really exist prior, as far as I know, in any like um, uh, uh, codified uh, educational kind of way before UCB established that. Um, that was, uh, I think, I, I, I don't even know how many years ago. Um, but since then, it has become a uh, one of the, like the tracks that you can learn in UCB. And eventually, like, it, it, it's a very... It's, it's such a specific niche because character comedians only really exist on SNL or a variety sketch show, or that's it, nothing else. So it's like you're, you're, you're spending all your time learning this skill set that uh, if you don't get on SNL or Mad TV doesn't come back, then there's really nothing you can do with the skill set uh, practically. However... Or, you know, of course, that's not totally true because the things that you learn are kind of like you learn how to write for yourself. You write how to uh, stagecraft. You learn how to like present this whole thing by yourself. And um, and all these characters, the 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 kind of polished version that most people are aware of are like the the weekend update like desk pieces that you see on SNL. So like uh, Bowen Yang's uh, Iceberg from the Titanic or uh, Stefan, Bill Hader's Stefan. These are all characters that are like. They're basically doing a one-person comedic monologue from the point of view of a comedic character, um, or Matt Fo uh, uh, uh Sorry, uh, Chris Farley's Matt Foley Van Down by the River was a character that um, what's his name Bob Odenkirk wrote for him at Second City, and then they just kind of like transferred it over for TV for for SNL. Um, so, um, if I may ask, um, that also leads to the question that you you also rightly point out that there might not be a lot of opportunities. What would happen if you got cast on, say, Tim Robinson's I Wish You Would Leave or maybe a very black sketch show or something like that? Would you be valued for your ability to read lines or maybe to add something to the, the scenes? Uh, you, mean, you mean black lady sketch show? 
the Black Lady Sketch Show. There's there's a small number yeah. of sketch shows that are still out there, and you are correct. Sure. It is a very small market. Yes, I mean I, I find this is <laughs> this is kind of like actor brain talking now. I find that when you get cast for those sketch shows, if you do get cast, if you're lucky to get cast, it's either because you look like the type of character they need for that comedic moment or because <laughs> they know you and like you and want you to do your thing <laughs> on that show. And if that's the case, you know, they would encourage you to improvise, I, I assume. Um, that being said, if they don't know who you are and you start improvising on like, I think you should leave, you know, most likely, I'm guessing people are like, stop that. <laughs> Don't do that. Uh, we have a sketch written. Stop making shit up. Yeah. It kind, um, of, it kind of gets, I mean, it's like stand ups, you know, like um, with anything with comedy, it's like you can get away with it if you can get away with it, right? Like all comedy is kind of like, what is my voice? I know what is funny. And then if it works, it works. And if it doesn't work, it's kind of like, why are you doing that? Don't do that. All right. So let's look at one of your sketches. Okay. All right, so um, I'm going to share my screen. Is that working, everyone? Do people see my screen? Oh, I have to press share. I'm going to do this group. This one, this is what, the first one I discovered on you. Nice. nice. The ad is not produced by you as far Hell as I know. Yeah. No, no, this is part of the bit, this, this HBO ad. <laughs> okay. Uh, we can't hear anything. Yeah, we can't hear it. I mean, I can, I can, I can close caption, explain to viewers what's happening. My favorite kind of comedy is the kind that where you explain what's happening to somebody. Yeah, could you just read the captions for us? Yeah, I'll just read the captions. the captions. But I'll do it not in my voice. I'll do it in a robot voice. Um. Okay, well, basically, in this sketch, I'm a Chinese tour guide, and I am setting up in a very racist way. Um, like, I'm, I'm like talking to uh, uh, other Chinese um, people on a tour. I'm saying that I'm setting up that there's like a jade, a uh, very valuable piece of jade, and I take a phone call, and I'm yelling and screaming in Chinese the whole time. And then when I cross stage, I make sure no one's looking at me, and I reveal, whoops, I dropped it. I'm actually a fluent English speaker, FBI undercover agent trying to track a jade thief. Um, so the whole bit is that at the very beginning, I come across very aggressively over-the-top Chinese stereotype in a way that people are like, oh, I don't know, I'm not sure exactly what I'm laughing at. Um, and then uh, I kind of undercut that by contextualizing it and then giving the audience like a, 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 a reason to laugh, like a, a, a something that allows them to laugh. Oren, I think in order for you to share audio, you need to have selected it. When does the audio the work, by the no. way? No, it does not. No, it doesn't. Oh, does the closed captioning work? The closed captioning does work, yes. <laughs> but we're not gonna be able to see it, un hear it, unless when you share the screen, you click that button that says share audio for the thing that you're selecting. Oh. My apologies. So, um, screen sharing. I don't know how to do that, but hopefully the closed captioning gives you a little bit of a view. Where did you perform this? Uh, this was at the UCB in Hell's Kitchen. Um, their, um, their stage on like 42nd Street all the way, way the fuck west. Like, I'm oh, sorry if there's kids. Sorry about that. Uh, sorry, Catherine, I see your, I see your child there. I'm just screaming curses over time. Um, it yeah. was when the UCB theater was all the way uh, like 42nd and like 11th Avenue at their like big, big location. Oh, cool. Uh, well, yeah, but until they got, you know, until COVID happened and they couldn't afford the rent anymore. But hey, they're coming back. They're coming back, baby. Cool, cool. Uh, great. So this is more of the bit. So yes, uh, hitting the game different ways. What else do Chinese stereotypes can I exploit? Oh, he's selling bootleg -like DVDs. Uh, <laughs> or viruses. Right. Yeah. Or, or that. Um, and then, so, oh yeah, those, well, this is all pre-COVID. So this was not, that wasn't even a joke that was available at the time. Um, and here I am calling out that, uh, I'm calling out the idea that I can be racist against Asian people and, uh, you know, because I am Asian, obviously. Um, 
and basically the, the sketch basically builds back and forth. So I'm like on one side of the stage, I am, I am a Chinese stereotype. And then I go over here and I could switch back to be normal. And I go back here to be racist again and go back here, be normal. And it ends right now with me going backstage and then coming out with the biggest thing that I could think of and get my hands on, which is a Chinese lion dance, which then I brought on stage and danced uh, to close out the sketch. And also I, I believe I'm singing in Chinese underneath this as well. That FBI agent's really like, he's really into the bit. He, like he is, not you. Well, yeah, no, he's committed. He's, he's yeah, like, this, yeah. is the, this is how we're going to catch this guy. <laughs> it's to bring out the dragon. <laughs> yeah, it's time. It's, I have to bring out the dragon in order to, you got, you know, it's like uh, Donnie Brasco. You got to go deep. How deep can you, are yeah. you going to go to catch the guy? Oren, let's check out another one. Sure. Um, well, every sketch of Woody's does have a punchline. So should we wait for the punchline, Woody, or? Uh, what do you mean? Is There is a punchline of the sketch. Um, yes. Uh, well, it's this I, I, I mean, I, I honestly think, I don't think you're going to get a bigger visual pop than me in a lion Hold costume. Hold on a sec. <laughs> I think that's I, going to hit harder than a joke that we're reading in closed caption, possibly. That's true and i do apologize for that but um so when you did that how do you write a sketch where there are people off screen that's i think the the most difficult part of it where not everyone that you're having dialogue with is participating you're having imaginary characters sure of course yeah and this is kind of one of the failings and limitations of the medium of doing a character piece because you're basically doing a one person sketch and this is like this is what's this is so granular by the way I apologies if i'm boring anyone with this but basically in order for me to like work on these bits it's not like a stand-up where you go up and you're like you get up and then you have some you have some bits and you kind of riff on them and then you tape it and you're like okay that worked that didn't work whatever uh because you're fundamentally just talking to the audience and and, and any audience member doesn't need to be explained what stand-up is they're like oh i get it you're telling me jokes at the end with characters it's like you're going up and you're just launching into a comedic sketch premise while you are not yourself and you're talking to people who aren't there and the audience is like what is happening are you talking to me like are is this is this cinema is this a uh, theatrical you know what i mean and so i had to start doing it in, in order to work these pieces i would often do open mics and i would have to literally explain to audience members like okay i'm about to do a character which is i'm doing this i'm doing this i'm doing this it's not like stand up but like here we go we're all gonna have a great time um because otherwise the first 30 seconds people are like i literally don't know what's happening and i'm confused Oh, that's um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, uh, and so what ends up happening with these kinds of, with these kinds of bits, uh, and if you watch the character's welcome YouTube page, uh, it's, it's like a recurring trope where you're like, um, you would need to straight man yourself. Like you wouldn't have to provide the voice of reason for your own kooky character yourself. So it's mm -hmm. like, you would do things like, okay, I know what you're thinking. How could a guy who blah, 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 he must think that blah, blah, blah. Well, in response to that, I say blah, 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 right? You're kind of, you have to, you kind of have to weave it in in a way that feels like a person would actually say it because yeah, you're right, Oren, you are having to sidestep this thing of like the, the constraints of the medium is just there's no other person kind of saying things at you or contextualizing the piece. Yeah. So you also, um, I also remember like about a decade ago, I interviewed someone from College Humor. Um, there were a number of people who would appear in College Humor videos like Pete Holmes, Ben Schwartz, uh, Thomas Middleditch. I think Allison Becker appeared in Pete Holmes. I interviewed a guy who was on Pete Holmes production company before he became famous. And he discovered an actress named Allison Becker who would end up on Parks and Recreation and there are um are you and then natasha rothwell came along a few years later and performed at ucb on a ucb sketch strip i'd watch all the time so a lot of these people kind of like in this little new york circle kind of grow big are you are, do you feel like it's going to take like another like a certain number of years for your cohort or do you have kind of a similar cohort where like you're all going to put each other in your movies and tv shows like what happened with silicon valley with the uh, um Pete Holmes, or I don't know what, you know, Melina Weintraub and uh, Thomas Middleditch were on the same show for a bit, and Kamel Nanjiani is another one from that era. Um, that's an interesting question, because I, I think also, 
people who go to UCB are very um, ambitious and are very like, they actively want to have a comedy career, right? Whether it's as an actor or as a writer or whatever. And so a lot of the times the people who you come up with end up if they stick around with it, like eight years, 10 years later are working at Comedy Central or are working as a, as assistant to somebody at Three Arts or, you know, whatever, They're, they are in some way still in the comedy world. And so, and you know, this is true for stand-up too. Uh, Valerie, you're saying you do stand-up. I imagine it's the same thing. Like you come up and you people start getting opportunities. And if you were within each other's social circles, you, you know, you come up with them if, if mm -hmm. they're like, you're like a in the project. same class. Right, exactly. Um, so in that sense, uh, yeah, I mean, there's people like I came up with Bowen Yang, for example, I did Story Pirates with him, which is a children's theater, kind of like sketch comedy troupe. Um, and he's obviously doing great right now. Um, and there's also like people I know who are writing in L.A. You know, it's it's so dispersed. That's the problem is that like everything ev there's no unlike all other career paths, the, the comedy career path is not sequential. It's not linear. It's just it doesn't look like this. It looks like this. You know what I mean? <laughs> you have no idea where your next job is coming from. And usually it's because like anything else, it's like you networked from this gig you did five years ago and someone remembers you. Um, so in that sense, it's kind of yes and no, because there are people I know who are like working professionally. Um, and there's also people I'm coming up that I came up with who are like doing great things right now. Um, and it's all, it, it, you know, it's every, everything's project to project. It's like, it's not really like, Oh, I have a crew of like five. It's not like I have a lonely island of like, you know, the three guys that I work with all the time. We always do it. We always do everything together. Well, that is interesting because you've actually. Um, I'll ask this question, then we'll show another clip, and then maybe a couple more questions, and I'll turn it over to the audience. You've actually been to the Edinburgh Film Edinburgh Fringe Festival and just for laughs, and I think you took a comedy troupe there. You did a um, sort of a, a riff on Shakespeare. Is that right? Um, at Edinburgh, you mean? Yeah. I did, uh, I went there and I did two shows. One was um, a musical parody of Game of Thrones called Thrones the Musical. Um, and the other one was uh, Baby Wants Candy, which is a musical improv troupe. I see. Um, and so like how much of, how much of your, I, I'm not sure if you're, if you're holding down another job while you're doing this or if you're, but how much of nope. your- Nope, 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 no job, nope. Okay, no great. Nope. So you have, if you want to stage a musical about Game of Thrones, you can actually devote hours on this. How do you coordinate with other people who might also be struggling actors when you when you take on such a big project? Um, well, that wasn't my, like, I wasn't the creator of that. I was an actor that was cast for it. Um, so I didn't produce it in that sense. Um, but the way I got that was it was, it was written, that musical was written by, um, the guy who was, who, who was the head of Baby Wants Candy. So he was already casting musical improvisers to go to Edinburgh to perform there. And he's like, and while we're at it, we have this other show. So I'm looking for someone who can, I'm casting for someone who can improvise, uh, musically, like improvise a long form musical narrative and also can learn these parts for this written uh, parody of Game of Thrones. Um, and that, that's, that script was already kind of like developed, worked on, revised, tweaked, perfected, you know, over various other runs uh, that I was just being slotted into to learn. And speaking of your ability to do musicals, uh, I think Valerie, I, I'm gonna turn it over to her. She is going to reenact, no, I'm just kidding. She actually <laughs> was able to, Get your clip for uh, coronavirus. You wrote the coronavirus musical, which is another favorite of mine of your a uh, uh, favorite work of yours. And we're gonna right, put that, it on the yeah. screen. Okay, you gotta enable screen sharing. Enable it. Yeah, we should just start a podcast called Troubleshooting or <laughs> Troubleshooting with Orin. Yeah, because I, I, I got to I mean, I thought I solved the problems last time. Uh, uh, multiple persons can share simultaneously. Okay, I did that. All right. Okay. Valeria, see if you can see work your magic. So, all right. So what do you, you said screen and then do I got to go advanced? There's like a little thing at the bottom that says like share with sound. Share sound. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Oh, I see advanced sharing options. You guys see it? 
Yes. All right. So this is the coronavirus musical. Coronavirus. Town Animal Market. Wait, sorry. There we go. Every day is the same in this small town animal market. Good morning, chickens. Good morning, cows. You want to hear a secret? One day I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to be a big star, and everyone's going to know my name. The coronavirus. Is that a cough I feel coming on? No, it's a song. <laughs> hey everyone, I know this is way too soon to be doing this. I'm just so scared of the coronavirus. I'm deeply scared of it. And I have family in Wuhan, that's true, and yes, they are quarantined. And it's just like, I don't know what the appropriate response is to that. But I do have an inappropriate response. <laughs> I can be tough for a virus. This is great because I start way too high and you're going to hear me reach the limits of my vocal range. To give and quickly spread around. Everyone wants me to disappear. There it is. Quickly go away. That's good. But no vaccine can ever cure my dreams to be on Broadway. So many people have left already. Why, oh, why can't I? Break out of this podunk town and have an outbreak in the sky. <laughs> you know what? Today's the day. I get on a truck and I head to the city. And look, there's an airplane. I sneak on board as a stowaway in someone's lungs. And then, once I'm airborne, I make it to New York City like that. <laughs> Here's the thing. The CDC has already said it's not a question of... I remember I did this. This was like literally a week before everyone was shut down in New York. Mike Pence? No. It's just like the idea of coronavirus in New York is fucking terrifying. Wow, here I am on Broadway, rubbing elbows with the stars. Let me prove that I can be a bigger deal than SARS. Yeah, coronavirus in the building, aka COVID-19, aka your pandemic, masks up, let's get it, uh, uh, gonna get famous, my reach is outrageous, a triple threat king, I rap and I sing and I'm highly contagious, yeah, I'm coast to coast up, I'm already global, you on my ground, I'm in Chinatown, fuck you up like Chernobyl, yeah, I'm taking over, uh, that's what I told you. Yeah, I'm inside your girl all over the world. My name is Corona. Blah! And I guess that's crazy because actually doing that rap makes me feel better. And I think it's because this is something I can control. Nothing can control me. Soon I go viral around the world thanks to your help. And then when I finally get as big as the flu, I think back to that provincial Chinese province. I remember my roots, I promise. Where I was discovered and told my mother it was either a bat or something called a pangolin that I'd spread my wings and fly. Never quarantine your dreams. <laughs> Wow, I I have not watched that since <laughs> since that came out. Oh wow, yeah. yeah um, wild. So how did you know that this would be received well, and that would whether whether it was in good taste? Because it seems it, like maybe talking okay. to the fourth wall erases it a little bit. Um, well, I remember when I wrote it, it went. I I wrote I redrafted this more than anything. I wrote like twenty drafts of this because I didn't know how to handle what it was. Um. I knew from the original premise, I, I, I knew I wanted to do something about coronavirus because it was topical and because it was specifically, you know, from China. And I was like, I, I know I have a take on this. I just have to figure out what it is and make sure it's done correctly. Um, and I pitched a couple things 
And it ended up being, I was working uh, with, this is with the Characters Welcome Program at UCB. It was with uh, Eric Fuhrer and Sarah Smallwood Parsons, who are brilliant character teachers. Um, and Sarah was like, oh, you know, it'd be funny if it's like the, the I just want to get out of the small town number from a musical, but it's coronavirus. And I'm like, that is really, really funny. Like, I have not heard that take before. Um, it kind of humanizes the virus in this weird way. Uh, and also gives it an angle and like puts it in a container that kind of like you can explore and is it opens it up for jokes. Um, and even then, as I was doing it, I was like, because it was so early, right? We didn't know anything about it. Like it wasn't in America yet. We didn't know how lethal it was. Everyone was terrified. There's so much like uncertainty about it. And part, and also, you know, the thing I say in the in the bit, which is like my parent, I have not my parents, my I have family in, in Wuhan, which is true. Um, so it was like there was a lot of. Uh, it was a very emotionally loaded thing that I wanted to handle correctly, because also I think with something like this, if I'm Chinese and presenting this thing and there's a predominantly white audience watching it, they're going to be like, what is the take here? Like, is it OK to laugh? And what am I laughing at specifically? Like you, Chinese person, need to give me permission to laugh and point at the thing specifically that we're laughing at. And so um, that this container, I think, jujitsu a lot of that in a very clean way. But there was still an element of like, I don't know how, I don't know how to address the fact that I have like real actual human feelings scared about this. And, uh, and that's what the breaking the fourth wall thing. I was like, I think it just needs, I think the audience just needs to hear me as a person, tell them what I actually think about this so that it can release attention and they can enjoy laughing at like the sillier part of this. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I, I read a great book called the comic mind by Gerald Mastin in college about how comedy works psychologically. And they always say like, one of the very earliest theories on comedy was like the releasing of tension and how you manage that. So, um, um, so you've also- oh, Sorry, Valerie, were you, uh, what, Valerie, were you about to say something? Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was thinking that it was pretty interesting because I could tell you were breaking the fourth wall, but the content actually was written in such a way that like, you could think that the coronavirus had said that about itself too. <laughs> or is you, could, you, could, you could take it both ways. Yeah, like it's both. It's kind of like almost uh, mathy. It's cool. And you've also um, guested, guest starred on a few shows, Life and Beth, uh, Girls Five Ever. I just saw your your spot. I just watched your episode today where you were a music director on a. Uh, you, I actually thought you were a. I thought you directed the episode in which you humbled right. me by saying that. Yes. For those who I, don't know, uh, I did a pre-pro call with Oren and he was like, oh, I saw that you directed an episode of Girls 5 Eva. I'm like, no, I wish. Uh, actually, I played a music video director in the episode of Girls 5 Eva. Significantly less money uh, and stature. But still, I was like, it, I'm glad that people might think that I did that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so what is it, what is it generally like to, uh, work on these sets? How much auditioning is involved for something like, uh, you know, Girls 5 Eva or, uh, You Were on Bull or Life After Beth? Um, with, well, it depends the, how big the part is. Um, basically for those that don't know in, in TV, the kind of like hierarchy of roles that you have is like co-star, which is also called an under five, meaning you have less than five lines. Um, and those, those roles typically have, don't even have names or just have job titles. So it's like music video director or like garbage man or whatever. And then there's guest star, which is, um, you're there, you have several scenes in that episode, more money, um, more screen time. And then there's, uh, recurring, which means you're a character that recurs throughout that season, throughout multiple episodes. And then there's series regular, which is like George Clooney and ER or like, you know, uh, main characters in shows essentially so for these bits like in ball and in girls five eva uh, those are co-stars so they're all short small bits you know i'm not really more than like two scenes at tops um for those it's just a self-tape it's like you know they'll give you a breakdown and they'll give you the the, the sides the the script of your scenes and then you tape yourself and you send it in and if they like it they're like okay this is the person very rarely will they do a callback for a co-star but they will do a callback for i think generally depending on the show, guest stars recurring, like bigger parts where they're like, okay, we have to see if this person actually can take direction and know, knows what they're doing. If you'll permit me to ask a guilty question, uh, how well are you treated in terms of like trailer, craft services, things along those lines when you're in the <laughs> co-star range? Same. I mean, it's really just like, 
you ever you have access to everything that like the crew has you know so you have like what's called a honey wagon is basically just like a room in a trailer um and you have access to crafty which is just like a table of like snacks and whatever if you are higher up on the billing i think you have like better food options because like when they're like okay hey co-star guy woody um these are the lunch options it's gonna it's da 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 or da 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 and Can you what you're choosing from, yeah well i can request it i don't know if they'd I don't know if they'd pay for it. I think they'd be like, well, if you want to get Grubhub, go ahead. I think it'd be uh, a fun, petty move. Yeah. I, well, I'm not, I certainly am not big enough to like request a rider to be like, hey, um, <laughs> I think I want Shake Shack. Um, but, but these shows are shooting in, they're not shooting in the 30 mile zone in Los Angeles. They're shooting in New York, I'm guessing. Yeah. Like Girls 5 is, is, is shot in New York. Uh, Bulls shot in New York. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, because I think the um, I think if I'm not mistaken, there are union rules about transportation if you're in thirty within thirty miles of downtown Los Angeles. Uh, well, I mean, depending on where the production is, yeah. So, like for example, these shows are all shot in New York. Um, so the, the SAG rules are based around, you know, how many hours I work, uh, and they'll pay for transportation depending on what time my call is like if the call is at five in the morning typically they would pay for the a car service or something um i'm less familiar with the la sag rules but i assume they're something similar we're really getting yeah i, I don't even know how fascinating people find the little details about how the uber works to for movie no, stars i'm, I'm gonna call it my sag i'm gonna call it my sag rep and then we'll put them on speaker on this call you really we'll do want to... um we don't have to do that i you think he'd like that no, I'm joking. I'm joking. Okay, yeah, I was, I was wondering if how. I mean, you know, it could be funny. But uh, um, so why don't we open up to the um, why don't we open up to the to the to the room and find out if anyone else has some good questions for Woody? Uh, like, what type of writing did you start out with? Like, I assume you probably wrote stuff as a kid, right? Oh, well, I, as a kid, I yes. Um, in high school, I did a lot of comics drawing i did a lot of um uh being a putz and drawing comics like in my notebook um which i ended up drawing comics in college like the school paper um but writing i didn't really do until uh fairly recently um and those were all all sketch my background's all sketch i never i haven't done stand up um and so all of my writing was based around short form comedic uh within the sketch container. So like introduce the premise, unusual thing, hit it three times and the sketch. Um, that's really cool. That's yeah, that's the background. So do you think like when you did the comics in high school, would you like storyboard them? Like, were they like strips or? They were strips. Yeah, they were like little like four panel strips. They were very stupid. I, <laughs> I, I love that we're talking about them like in high-minded terms because they were the stupidest comics. They were like, the characters included, um, Constantly screaming man was one of the characters. Uh, <laughs> jazz head, who's per, who's a character whose head is a word bubble that says the word jazz in it. It, it was incredibly. I was also like I was in college. Hey man, so I was smoking weed, bro. Heard of it? And so a lot of these characters were like very stupid. Um, I have a question. Um, how do you navigate the line between funny and offensive, which I think is probably becoming an even more serious, I think, concern now. Totally. So just curious That's about a great that. question. Uh, that is a, a fantastic question. I think it comes down to a lot of things. It, it, it comes down to uh, yourself, meaning like, what are what is your intersectionality? Meaning like, are you queer? Are you straight? Are you a man? Are you a woman? What's your ethnicity? Like where you are relative to um, your audience, number one. So it's like, if you're a black standup, and a white audience that's a different relationship than if you are like a chinese stand up with like a, a black audience right it's like the dynamics of those situations are different and in those different situations they allow for different permissions for jokes i think because at the end of the day with comedy it's like you can get away with it if you can get away with it that being said you can get away with it and 10 years later someone could call you out on it and you're canceled because it doesn't date well in retrospect right but I think the rule of thumb to always go off of is uh, what direction is this joke punching? Who is the, who is getting, you know, are you punching down or are you punching up with this joke? Am I making fun of Donald Trump, which is punching up because 
he's Donald Trump, he has wealth, he has power, et cetera. Or am I punching down on like someone who's less fortunate than I am? You know, it's like, that's really kind of, I think the core compass that I would go off of. Do you admire comedians who might, it seems that a lot of great comedians probably might be canceled now. If do you admire, do you have role models who are edgy or do you see them through a different lens? Cause you mentioned 10 years from now, certain people might be cancelable. Sure. I think it depends. Cause I, uh, a lot of my comedic heroes are not standups. And I think with standup, there's a hot there. It, it, uh, it's easier quote unquote to cancel standup because they're like literally saying their points of view. Right. As opposed to like a filmmaker uh, who like whose point of view is kind of sublimated inside the yeah. narrative of the story they're making, right? Uh, it's it's more indirect. Um, that being said, most of my heroes are not stand-ups. Like one of my heroes, for example, is Jordan Peele, right? He's not a stand-up, but he's brilliant. And the stuff he's making, I think, would not be canceled <laughs> 10 years from now. I hope not. Uh, because I think it follows all these things. It's like uh, uh, he's spotlighting a voice that you don't normally hear, that is normally disenfranchised, and he's presenting it in a compelling, interesting, like metaphorically rich way that is also entertaining. Um, and so for that reason, me personally, uh, I don't think people I love, like I love Phoebe Waller-Bridge. I don't think she would be canceled in 10 years, but you know, I don't know. I don't know what she's done in her life. I hope not. What about Eddie Murphy or Kevin Hart, who've made jokes that are critical of the LGBT community and then probably evolved in their comedy as with the community of uh, can be seen in a different light? Yeah, go um, on record about Kevin Hart. Go. Yeah, I'll sound off on Kevin Hart. Um, well, without getting too into their specifics, I personally, this is a real thing I believe. I believe that stand ups, especially if you're a male stand up, should stop after 50 because, like, you know what I mean? Like when you are, when you get to a certain age, you're, and you dedicate your life to following a career where it's all about defending your point of view to an audience and controlling that room and like dominating the audience. It gets to a point where you're like, okay, well, these, these opinions I have might not be super progressive, but I'm not going to back down on them. And I'm like, that doesn't like, why is it just to be combative and to, like follow the stand up purity ethos or like, cause if you really want to make something like produce, other creators who like align with your view. You know what I mean? I don't, I, I just feel like after a certain point, when I watch standups after a certain age, I'm like, ah, oh, that point of view is like, I just, I, I'm enjoying this because you're very skilled and you have a lot of experience, but like, I wish you didn't say that because it's kind of bumping me right now. Uh, oh, well, I guess I'll just enjoy the rest of this special. Um, Do you have such a career trajectory that you're thinking about what it's going to happen to you what you might be doing after 50 or do you just generally try to take it year by year <laughs> no <laughs> i have no idea i have no clue um i also looked at your resume i don't think it lists a college that you trained at uh, i went to wesleyan but i didn't um i went to there for american studies the most vague made up sounding major on planet earth because it okay. is okay so um did you have so it didn't sound like you had um like a sort of a childhood, maybe, I'm not sure if you had a childhood experience acting or being on stage or performing. Was this- No, no, all my background is improv. Like I, that's why I started doing this was because my first thing I did was improv in New York. And how likely was it to, after college, to discover improv and then get to a point where you're cast on TV shows and such like that, as opposed to someone who might have studied it Northwestern or Carnegie Mellon or you know something like that or Juilliard or really good acting school. Mm. Um, that's a great question. I don't. It's hard to say because um, it's easy to it's easier to switch from comedy into drama than it is to go the other way around. I think if someone because like, I think funny being funny is like an inherent thing, and like you can learn timing, but like there's it, it it's that's what they that's what they say is that like if you're a comedian it's easy to transition to drama it's a lot harder to start as a drama actor and then transition to comedy um that being said i think if you are like classically trained of course that's very helpful 
But at the end of the day, when you are applying for a job, um, it, it my goal is comedy, right? I don't want to be a dramatic actor on a on a police procedural. It's not interesting to me. So the the jobs I'm trying to get are comedy jobs or at comedy acting jobs. And so in that sense, at the end of the day, what they're looking for is is this person funny? Do they know how to like exist in this in this scenario uh, in a way that I believe them? Um, and in that sense, it doesn't matter if I'm trained at Yale or trained at UCB, because if I'm able to be that character in that story for them in a comedic way, then they're like, great, this is the person. How they're trained doesn't really matter because they're able to do it. Oh, I sort of meant the way that colleges have acting programs and they teach people to be on stage and perform. And part of what you do on a TV show or on stage is to perform. And it sounds like, nowhere in the in the first 22 years of your life were you performing right yeah not really i was not so i was wondering kind of just in the late the, my question was more about the late bloomer angle of your career mm -hmm. which okay. is pretty impressive to not uh not have performed to not be a show business baby but not just that but again not even act in college not act in high school not acting at any stage of it and i mean so but you had the writing you know like in a way you're acting out in your own head. Yeah, Valerie, I mean, I agree with you, Valerie, because I think a lot, the, the, the advantage you have to that is most actors, a lot of actors don't write, right? And so they're just sitting there waiting to get the script that someone else wrote to then like bring it to life. Right. And most writers don't act, right? But if you are a stand-up, you're already writing material for yourself that is for your own voice. Mm -hmm. and, um, and if you can learn how to act on, with those words, you know what I mean? You're doing two people's jobs at the same time. That's why like so many, so it's so easy to transition a stand-up into the TV world, like Seinfeld or like, right. you know, Chris Rock, like people who wrote stand-up first because their comedic premises and conceits and points of view are so clear already that mm -hmm. they're like, okay, we'll just put them in these situations. Um, right, yeah. And now Ray Romano is starting to get into like really deep roles, which is the last thing, you know, he just sort of transitioned into it. If you think about it. Yeah, totally. Yeah, um, comedy to drama channel. Um, did anyone else have any other questions? Adam, do you have anything? Yeah, um, I was just wondering, I mean, uh, with Bo and Yang, not just being on SNL, but especially after they had the mass ex exodus, he's probably performer, if not one, two there. Kind of does... Do you think his success will help uh, pave the way for yourself and other Asian Americans that, that are up and coming? Mm. I really hope so. I mean, like, it's all, it's like, for any group that you don't normally see represented on TV, the more you see, the more people from that group that you see on TV, just increases your understanding and awareness that they exist and the different types of people that exist within that community. And I think that's always good. So it's like Bo and Yang, I have not seen a person like Bo and Yang on TV before. And now that I have seen him, it kind of opens the door a little bit more for someone who's coming behind him, right? Who like might be similar to him or not be similar to him. But I, I think every everybody that opens the door a little bit allows a more sophisticated, interesting, nuanced version of that person to come after them. Yeah, um, although I think Mikey Day, I don't know. I'm a bit of a Mikey Day fan. I'm not sure how competitive SNL has to be if you have to just like one guy on there. I actually thought Chris Wright was my favorite, and I'd love to know if you have any inside scoop on why he left. But Oh, yeah. Unfortunately, I do not know. I can call my SAG rep, ask him. Why yeah, you got the same SAG rep as Chris Wright? Call him. <laughs> um, Shmuel had a question. Yes, Um this might be a little more of a personal question, but uh, like I was the class clown in elementary school. I just kind of think of myself as like a person who's cracking jokes left and right. Um, is that your personality or do you take more of a professional approach to your comedy? Like how do those two worlds kind of come together? That that's a that's a very great question because I don't think I was, I was totally introverted. I was a nerd, you know, I like read a lot of comic books and like spent a lot of time by myself. Um, uh, but I don't think there's, you know, like I said before, there's no clear path 
to becoming the thing, right? There's there's many comedic actors who were definitely the class clown and goofed off and, you know, were like the center of attention um, that then went on to become stand-ups or writers or in the comedy world in the same way that uh, I considered myself very introverted uh, and ended up doing this because I love it. Um, at the end of the day, I really think it's just you, in order to do it, you need to have the thing inside of you being like, I feel like compelled to do this. And I feel like I wouldn't be happy if I didn't do this. You know what I mean? Um, because at the same time, it's like for any career, it's like, but this one specifically, it's like so much of it is you have to just put in the work. And like, if you are funny, that's fantastic. That's a great starting point, but there's lots of people who are not funny and work their asses off and become famous comedians. You know what I mean? And there's people who are very, very funny, but don't put in the time. And then they're just very funny people, but they're not professional comedians. Right. Right. The sweat tax. Yeah, exactly. The sweat tax. What exactly does the work go into if you're, what is the sweat going into? Is that sort of, I'm not sure what you mean by, because I imagine if you're funny, you just go on stage and be funny, I guess. What's this? I mean, yeah, if you're writing a play, I imagine that's <laughs> writing a play and figuring all that is big. But um, what about, you know, what does the sweat go into if you're, I don't well, know. He has to memorize it, Oren, and he has to write it and like figure out how. Right. I mean, you value, you're, you're completely correct. I mean, a lot of it's, it's crafting, right? If you're going up, if you're a stand up and you're going on stage, there are some people who are brilliant and could just start talking and they're naturally funny, but a lot of standups craft the jokes very carefully in the pauses and what word they're landing on, you know, like they're, they're setting up all this stuff so that it appears casual when you do it. But yeah, yeah it's, it's figuring that out. It's figuring out what you have to say. It's figuring out what your comedic voice is and why you're not someone else, you know, like why would someone go buy a ticket to see specifically you and not five other standups at the comedy cellar or whatever it is. Yeah, Jim Carrey said he used to do that, but he said it was all it also used to exhaust him and he would have to like go to sleep really early and he would be physically drained, but he did as an experiment to try not to write his stuff. Um mm-hmm. I mean even yeah. Robin Will even Robin Williams, who I'd always assume just because the way he delivered it was it was all off the cuff because it seemed like he was possessed by a forest and it was all just kind of spewing out of it out of him but then later actually not too long ago i read a biography of him and he actually you know really practiced his routines and refined them so that 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 was that was very eye-opening so like you know so i I can only imagine the rehearsal and the dedication having I, i imagine you would need to do the basic concept but then continually refine it based on audience feedback right absolutely i mean it's it's a at the end of the day, it's a theatrical performance, right? Is like, if you watch a Robin Williams stand up special, none of that is, I'm sure there are parts of it that are improvised, but a lot of it's blocked out, right? There's a director that's like, I think it's more impactful if you stand here in this moment to deliver this, you know, we're going to ha- rig a light for this moment, for this comedic moment, you know, like all of that is, is prepared so that it has the most impact um, as opposed to just standing still holding a mic, talking for an hour and then walking off stage, you know, like, it's all, it's a theatrical thing. It's presentational. Yeah, I, I'm a fan of Patton Oswalt. I remember I saw a video and then there was a director, there was the credits and there was a director on his stand-up special. I said, what is it there a director to do other than just, you know, point the light? How are you going to direct a, a, a comic who wrote, wrote it all himself, you know? Yeah, I mean, but it's, it is a theatrical experience. Like there, you need someone else standing out watching you objectively telling you how to with preferably with theatrical experience to tell you how to make each moment bit story whatever work better be as impactful as possible like squeeze every moment out of your bit i see well to close off i want to say woody what made me notice you was that you weren't just a person who was just on stage telling jokes when you wrote the coronavirus the musical when you did that thing as the tour guide you were I felt like taking something to the next level. Uh, it was a really great, it was certainly something that I could see just, you know, really something very thoughtful and creative. And I want to thank you so much for sharing that with us. Oh, thank you, Arne. And I also want to mention that uh, Valerie has been participating a lot and has sort of often taken the role of the informal tech support. I believe she's moved, last time I saw her in person, it was in Baltimore, but I think she moved to New York. 
Yeah, so maybe, in Brooklyn though. Maybe you'll catch each other at a set somewhere. I don't know. So mm -hmm. who knows? Yeah, I'm in South Slope. Woody does a lot of stand up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, maybe Valerie will see Woody somewhere. Maybe in the hierarchy, I imagine Woody is probably the guy who's the headliner and Valerie's more the, I don't know where you two are in your careers at the moment, but. Um, I don't either. <laughs> yeah, no, so but nobody does. My thank SAG rep so does. Uh, he's, he's actually, my SAG rep is actually my manager. Hello? I'm yeah. not manager. Well, thank you so much Somebody for calling. There's, <laughs> there's so many other, um, um, other people on that channel that like Chrissy Shackleford and like, yeah, a lot of brilliant performers on that channel. Yeah. Desi Domo is brilliant. Uh, Corinne Wells is brilliant. Uh, yeah, a lot of them funny. are just like, that was like the Victorian bride thing was hilarious. And the teen star, if you ever know how to get in touch with them or something, and I'll try to keep getting better at the technology so we can keep this going. But Woody, I really appreciate you. And I'm definitely looking forward to spreading the gospel of Woody around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah you, would get, you. you would get, people would riot because they're like, that's sacrilegious. Um, thank you very much for having me, Erin. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for tuning in. All right. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thanks, thank you. Erin. Thanks, everyone.